Here, Steve installs a typical window magnetic sensor. He first marks the location of his cable on both the frame and the sliding pane, retrieves the cable, strips and preps two conductors, and attaches the conductors to the switch contact. He then centers and secures the contact to the frame using the contact adhesive backing. He then preps the track of the pane and attaches the magnet with its adhesive backing, plus a dab of sealant for good measure. At each door, ASL installs a recessed contact in the frame. It's installed by directly crimping the pigtail wires on the sensor to the conductors of the cable. The crimp connectors and cable are then pushed into the opening. And sealant is used to secure the contact in the opening. Steve marks the location of the contact on the door. Drills the hole for the magnet and secures the magnet in place with sealant. Meanwhile, Jason installs the first of two motion sensors. They use two conductors for power and two for a normally closed contact. We have two Omni keypads, this one in the master bedroom and the other at the utility room entry door. After measuring the correct height, Steve uses the back to mark the cutout and mounting holes. Cuts the cable opening and retrieves the cable, then secures the back to the drywall. He preps the cable and attaches the provided connector using the pigtail conductors. So you're getting ready to put the stuff in the security panel. Yeah. Well, let me give you a hand. Okay. Now you want to, we've got the A bus in here, the HAI panel, and that's about it other than the security equipment. That's it. Okay. So these are our uh, uh, audio cables these and are for these the are A-bus. security stuff and these are all your security sensors. Right. Okay. Well, let's get started. You want to start from the top down? Yeah. If let's do start from the top down. All right. Why don't you grab the, that. So the panel just snaps in. Okay, here, let's stick the uh, A bus guy in. So you're just going to come down with your cables and wrap around. Yeah, we'll tie them off to the side so it keeps everything nice and neat. Okay, uh, let's get the power strip. Uh, you want that a little high out of the way of, you want, it's okay to put these cables behind there? Yeah, there's a little bit of a gap back there, so we can okay. put them behind there. Yeah, keeps you everything a little out of the higher way. than that. So see the mark? Yep, you're right. Missed that one. Yeah. Okay, so the A-Bus power supply then, so we've got the X10 module that's going to go in there, mm -hmm. and you'll have the um, power supply for the board. Yeah, the transfer the will sit in the bottom. Okay, and then the A bus power supply is going to go in there and, and power that thing, right? Yep. Okay. Um, well, if there's anything I can do since we put the uh, this stuff in, I wrote on there where the you know each wire goes to the panel. Okay. So I'll let you get started on it. I'm going to go uh, start on the cameras outside. We'll catch up with you later. All right. Okay. Eric starts the process of sorting out the security sensor cables and getting them organized into zones for attachment to the security processor board. Next, Rich and I are going to mount the uh, cameras inside and outside. I'm, here, I'm going to install this one on the front porch. Now we're going to use these small uh, bullet style color cameras and I've gone ahead and pre-mounted these on the plates in the office to save time during installation. The 12 volt DC power connector conductors are crimped to four conductors of the Cat5 cable. When distributing power over Cat5 cable, use at least two of the conductors for each polarity to minimize the voltage drop in the cable due to the resistance of the wire. 
We standardized on combining the orange pair conductors for positive and the green pair for negative. I'm using a two-piece crimp connector. First, slip the crimp ring over the cable. Then remove an inch of insulation. The video cable uses BNC connectors. And since I didn't have a coax stripper set for BNC dimensions on the site, I had to do it the old-fashioned way. Familiar to many of you, I'm sure. Peel back the outer braid, remove the inner foil, peel back the inner braid, and trim them to about half inch. How much insulation you remove and the center conductor length depends on the brand of connector you use. The connector pushes under the braid and the braid is folded over and under the crimp ring. The ring is then crimped tight to the jacket and braid. The connectors push back into the outlet and the camera is attached normally. Yes, as always, the stucco crew has some patching to do. Finally, I do a rough position adjustment and set. We'll do a final adjustment during configuration. Meanwhile, Rich uses the same procedure to install the in-wall camera in bedroom one. The lens is recessed in the wall is covered by a plexiglass cover. Steve finishes up the camera in the great room, the same type we used outside. Now we're going to be using a Core Access Omni 6 home control and user interface system. Now installation is simple. It consists of simply attaching power our Ethernet uh, network connection and a serial interface back to our Omni LT home automation panel. Once the cables are attached, the panel screws right to the rough end box and the cover just snaps in place. Very nice. Next, we'll install the HAI Omni thermostats, one for each of two heating and cooling zones in this house. This is a single stage thermostat for heating and cooling, which is what we need in this application. They're wired directly back to the Omni controller, and they connect to the HVAC equipment just like a normal thermostat. Since we forgot to get Rich the right tools for this shot, he had to attach the HVAC wires with his pocket knife. He then attaches the supplied serial interface connector to the Cat5 cable from the panel using crimp connectors. That looks perfect, doesn't it? Okay. What the heck is this cable, and who botched up the raw fan opening? The thermostat for the master suite zone is mounted in a poor location for monitoring temperature, so we installed a separate temperature sensor in the center of the space. We mounted a shelf for the wireless access point and attached the power module and data cable. Next we're going to be installing the in-wall and in-ceiling speakers. Now we're using Channel Vision's ABUS audio distribution system. The volume controls receive baseband audio and power over Cat5 cable from the distribution panel and output amplified uh, audio to the locally attached speakers. There is a row of LEDs which indicates the volume level and a built-in infrared sensor which sends infrared signals back to the input module in the entertainment center. Right, e uh, convenient remote control from anywhere there's a volume control. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like Steve has already started installing the in-ceiling speakers here in the dining room, right Steve? That's right, Grayson. I'm going to be using Channel Vision's round retrofit, very easy to install speakers. Okay, one on each corner here. Looks yes. good. Yep. 
Well, I'll give you a hand putting it in. Okay. And I'll go ahead and get the volume control installed. Okay, thank you, Rich. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you've already got the thing marked. Yep. Very good. Ready to cut. All right. Well, Steve, I know we staple these speaker cables up here real well, but looks like uh, somebody decided they were going to do us a favor. Yeah, it's a common mistake. Somebody just stubbed that out for us in the wrong spot. We'll just have to pull it back through and just patch over it. That's the cable. And it looks like they did a little spotter job on the other side. Why they picked that place, we have no clue. Again, it's an easy fix. Yeah, but it's typical for a residential installation. Sure. You always run into these screw-ups when you come back on the job. It happens. Okay. What do you need first? Um, I'm going to put on my glasses and I'm going to go ahead and cut some drywall. So All right. So hand me my drywall saw. Okay. Like most of the ceiling installations, we ran a two-conductor 16-gauge cable to each speaker from the volume control. The black conductor to the negative terminal and the red to the positive terminal. Recess screws engage the locking tabs and secure the speaker to the sheetrock. And the grill just snaps into place. Now, in the master bedroom, we pre-wired for two in-wall speaker locations, on the east wall or west wall, depending on where the uh, customer put their bed. Well, the builders told us that the bed is going to be over on the east wall, so we're going to work over here on the west wall. Okay. Now, why don't we get our location mark from our notes we did at pre-wire. Uh, on the left here, where the middle of the stud bay is 22 inches in. All right. Right there. Okay, we're going to be using these rectangular channel vision in-wall speakers and they come with a template to help us cut the right, uh, to cut the hole to the right size. Okay, I talked to the builder about this. He was okay with 60 inches above the finished floor to okay. the bottom of the speaker. All right, we've got that marked. If this was the stud, I want to come in about a half inch so that the ears have sheet work to grip. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to slide over about a half an inch. Okay. And I want the bottom of the frame to be at my 60 inch above finished floor mark. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. this hole. All right, go ahead. Okay. Good. Here's our wire. Well, we locked out this time. Okay. During pre-wire, we daisy-chained a 14-4 cable from the left side to the right. Well, so we have to crimp the red-green pair of both cables together here for the right speaker. Okay, white to positive for left channel, and black to negative for left channel. Good connection. All right. Okay, I'm gonna get the grill back in. Beautiful. Okay. While Rich mounts the other speaker, I tackle the volume control. Since we pre-wired to both sides, I select the correct 14-4 cable. I prep the Cat5 cable from the panel and punch it down to the 110 connector. I then prep the 14-4 speaker cable. Red green for the right speaker, white black for the left. I want to store the other pre wired speaker cable for easy retrieval in case the homeowner decides to rearrange furniture. Earlier in the dining room, Rich connected separate 14-2 cables for each speaker. 
making sure to get each speaker wired to the correct side. While Rich continues with the volume controls, I mount an A-Bus source module in the Entertainment Center. This interfaces the baseband analog inputs to Cat5 cable. I connect it to one of the Cat5 jacks that's wired to the A-Bus termination module in the 28-inch enclosure. You get it okay? Mm-hmm. Well, our last stop is up here on the roof. We need to mount the FM the uh, broadcast off-air antennas in the satellite dish. The off-air antenna is for DTV only, so we're going to use a good UHF only Yagi Uda antenna. <laughs> Yagi it is. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Rich, why don't you take the uh, FM antenna, I'll take the uh, okay. broadcast off-air, and when we get done with those, we'll start on the satellite dish. Okay, sounds good. All right. Earlier, I made sure we could get the needed signal strength on this part of the roof, while pointed directly at the broadcast site on top of an 8,000 foot mountain about 25 miles away. And to make sure reflections weren't too bad from the adjacent mountain. We started by mounting two short masts sufficiently separated to prevent interaction, at least three feet. Then mounted the antennas. We're using an omnidirectional FM antenna since FM stations are located all over the place. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah, it's not too bad. Next, we retrieve the six coax cables and ground wire we pre wired. Put an extension nope. on. Okay, oh, well, I'll reach the uh, base of it. Rich prepares a short RG6 cable using weatherproof F connectors that'll go from the FM antenna to the grounding block at the base of the UHF antenna OSHA and connects it to the ballon, covering the connectors with weatherproofing boots. Okay. <laughs> he then connects a length of 10 gauge ground wire from the mast to one of the two grounding blocks we secure to the base of the UHF antenna and connects the coax to the block as well. I connect the ground conductor from the house to the other grounding block. Rich attaches and secures another short coax cable from the UHF antenna to the grounding block. With a signal level meter attached to the right. block, we then align the antenna. Uh, antenna is right on the top of that uh, uh, mountain over there. The big you mountain? See. Yeah, okay. so we've got a line of sight path right to it. All right. So you can almost aim this thing right by sight. Once aligned, we attach the coax cables from the distribution center to the grounding blocks. You know, this thing looks a little flimsy for the roof here, I think with a wind load. Worried about that. Yeah. yeah. I think we'll come back and uh, put a heavier duty. Uh, do I a, can put a little do a platform base. Yeah, either that or I can put a little triangle mount in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that'll do it. This, even though this, I thought this was short enough, it would do it, but it's a little too long. Okay. Let's go get we'll the satellite dish. That. All right. Rich gets the job of preparing the cables. While well, I mount the mast, aligned with the slope of the roof. The mast contains a small bubble level to make it easy to get the mast perfectly vertical. I tighten the mast in place. I then set the approximate elevation on the dish for our latitude. Then mount the dish on the mast and tighten it down, but loose enough so we can still aim it. Then we do a preliminary azimuth alignment using a signal level meter attached to the primary LNB. The meter supplies the necessary power to the LNB. We then attach our four LNB cables from the multi-switch left and right hand channels from each LNB. We'll do a final alignment after the homeowner equipment is installed. You good with that? Yeah. Okay, well right. I think that takes care of everything, except uh, let's get the equipment installed in the panels downstairs and get the networks configured. Okay, well let's get all this stuff off the roof. I gotta go take a leak. <laughs>
Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Excellent. What happened to Eric? He had to go. Well, I hope you're going to finish up the panel today with us. We sure will. Okay. Give me a little overview of what you're doing here. Well, we're just grouping the wires together by zones. Okay. And then we're going to land them on the panel itself. Get that at, get that going. Finish up the sensors first. Then I hope you're going to do our A bus for us. That's right. Good. Excellent. Hey, I meant to remind you that I need a um, Cat5 cable from the uh, HAI board for our line seizure uh, to the RJ31 that's on our voice module over here. Sure. Sure. Because that's where our lines are coming in. All right. Okay. So Rich and I are going to try to finish these panels out today as okay. well. All right. So I'll we'll be keeping you company here. Great. I'll just finish this up for you. All right, Rich. Let's get uh, RF City. Let's start on the RF panel. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Uh, S3 and S2. S3 and S2. We already mounted the main internal and external splitters, so we only need to mount the remaining intermediate internal and external splitters. We then mount the main external distribution amplifier. Okay, you can follow along with the layout diagrams in the back of the workbook. Next comes the internal signal amplifier. Rich then starts from the bottom and mounts the satellite multi-switch. Then the four-channel camera modulator. With the modules mounted, Rich starts on connecting the external cable runs to the two 8-port external signal splitters. He then works on the internal cables to the 4 and 6-port internal signal combiners. We then connect the jumper cables we pre-made at the shop to interconnect the components. We'll connect the remaining cables from the satellite dish to the multi-switch inputs and connect the off-air and FM antenna cables to the F-connector terminating block. When the homeowner equipment is installed, we'll jumper the necessary outlet cables to the multi-switch outputs, off-air antenna, FM antenna, and so on. While Rich continues with the coax cables, I mount the router in the voice and data panel. Next, I install the two 8-port switches mounted on a common bracket over two of the data cable termination modules. This is a bit tricky. Then I start at the bottom and mount the power distribution module. Next in is a bracket to hold a camera web server. The server slips in and is clamped in place. With most of the equipment in, I install the main 15-volt power supply and connect it to the power distribution module, and then install the router power supply. We pre-made the power cables for the two switches in the office, and connect them up to the distribution module. We also pre-made any other cables we could, including this power cable for the camera server. I then prep the CAT5 part of the four camera cables to combine the power conductors and apply the connectors, and plug them into the jack supplying regulated 12-volt DC. Rich and I begin installing the voice and data jumpers, first between the voice modules. These are commercially made CAT5 jumpers. Referring to our design drawings, we installed jumpers from the 4-port switch in the router to the two 8-port switches. Then from the camera server to the router switch. And from the wireless access point cable to the router. We then complete the remaining jumpers from the data outlets to the 8-port switches. Okay, that's the last one, right? After lunch, we need to connect the camera coax cables to the four video inputs on the camera server. We made up some BNC T adapters with BNC to RCA adapters on one side, so we can daisy-chain the video signal through RCA cables from here 
over to the RF panel to connect the camera video to the four channel modulator. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, while Rich and I have been working away on the data and RF panels, Steve's been working away on DC3. He's finishing sorting out the security zones and connecting zone sensors, keypads, and alarms to the Omni screw terminals. Next, he punches down the Cat5 cables from the volume controls to the A-Bus audio distribution panel. The audio source cable will be punched down on the connector on the far left. Steve then connects an X10 Powerline interface module to the panel and plugs it in the power strip. Steve feeds me a Cat5 cable used to feed Voice Line 1 to the Omni panel for alarm line seizure. See if you need to test this thing, this little switch, this, this will throw it in the normal bypassing the security panel. Right. If I throw that up, then it's in the circuit. Gotcha. He preps the cable and attaches it to the Omni panel. No friction? Oh, this is great. These are the RCA cables we mentioned earlier that feed the camera video from the camera server over to the modulator. 